Welcome to this first lecture. We are going to be talking about the subject matter of economics. So what do we want to take a look at? We want to first of all define what economics is and some related terms. So economics is a social science that studies the use of scarce resources to satisfy unlimited ones. When we talk of scarce resources, we are talking of resources which are limited in supply. So we have limited resources, however, our wants are unlimited. We are going to be spending more time talking about these concepts in a few minutes. So economics is, first of all, a part of the social sciences. And when we talk of the social sciences, we are looking at a branch of studies that looks at an aspect of society. So different social science disciplines will look at different aspects of society. For example, sociology, we look at how people live together. Psychology will focus on the person. However, economics will analyze the economy. So one of the important parts of this introductory lecture, uh, lecture to economics is that it's going to familiarize you with the language of economics because we have a lot of terms which are unique to economics. Now, why should you even be taking this lecture? Why should you study economics? It's going to help you understand the economy and society. So when we talk of the economy, we are looking at how different groups or different societies organize how to use their resources to meet their different needs or their wants. It's going to help you better understand world affairs because lots of things going on around you are influenced by resources or by economics. You will become a well-informed citizen in the sense that when politicians are saying something, you clearly know what they are talking about. And when they are saying nonsense, you will know. It will help you to think logically uh, by applying the economics way of thinking. In addition, it will help you to be intellectually stimulated, challenged, and satisfied. Now, the next thing we want to look at, we want to look at how economics, and we want to continue looking at the importance of economics. Many everyday events involve economics. Economics helps us to think clearly about many important issues. Now, if you decide to become an economist, where will you work at the end of the day? You can work in banks doing what we call macroeconomic or economic intelligence. You can work in insurance companies. You can work at the university by teaching or by helping the economy understand the business cycle. You can work for the government and government agencies by helping them with their policies. You can be a researcher at a research institute. You can work for the United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the list goes on. So what do economists generally do? They do lots of things. For example, they may estimate the demand of certain uh, the demand for certain sec for certain goods. So before you produce, you want to understand if there is a demand for the good. That's one of the important things. You want to be able to forecast economic indicators. We are going to spend a lot of time in this module learning about different macroeconomic indicators, how to get them from the website of Statistics Canada, how to plot them and interpret them so that you really understand what economic indicators, what information you can get from it, how it can help you understand the macroeconomic environment. Economists not only do that, but they can forecast it using forecasting methods. You can determine the effects of a policy. When the government decides to put a policy out there, how will it affect you, your family, or society? Now, you can also study wages and employment. No one wants to lose their job. We want people to have jobs. However, we also want them to be well paid. What's the relationship? Now, let's move on to one of the first concepts, the concepts of scarcity. Generally, we say without scarcity, there is no economics. So scarcity simply means limited in supply in the context of economics. So when resources, resources are what we need to produce goods and services. We also call them the inputs of production. Resources are generally scarce. 
So here we are saying that unlimited ones in the face of limited means. So our wants, the things we want are unlimited. However, our means or our resources are limited. In other words, our means are scarce. So as a result of that, you have to make a choice. If you had unlimited resources, then you don't need to make a choice. For example, you being here watching this lecture, there are many things you could have been doing with your time, You have, but you don't have unlimited time, so you have to make a choice. So here this diagram is simply telling you, because you have limited resources, you have to make it, you are forced to make a choice. Now, what is a choice? Choice is simply the act of giving up something for another. So when you make a choice, you have given up an alternative. So you can't say you've made a choice when you've not given up something. So just think of what you gave up to be able to be watching this lecture right now. You could have been eating, you could have been watching a movie, you could have been relaxing or just going for a walk with your friends. But you gave up that to be able to watch this and that is what a choice is in economics. So we say a choice is a result of scarcity. Individuals and society as a whole must make choices. Think about it. In Canada, we have to make a choice how we use our resources. In the province of Ontario or of Quebec, they have limited resources and they must make a choice. How will they use it? Will they invest it in education? Will they build more schools, more hospitals? Or will they use it, I don't know, for some peacekeeping missions around the world? As a society, they have to make a choice because of scarcity of resources. Now, when we talk of resources, what do we mean by resources? First of all, resources are inputs used to produce goods and services. So in order to produce goods and services, we need resources. And they are also called factors of production. Now, when we talk of goods and services, what do we mean? Goods are tangible things that satisfy wants. So if you go, for example, to get a burger, you can actually touch the burger. So that's a good. It's tangible. You can touch it. Uh, your PC, your laptop, whatever you use for your studies, you can touch it. However, a service, these are intangibles that satisfy ones. For example, when you are listening to music or to the musician you like, you can touch that song. However, it satisfies a certain want. Now, when you are watching this lecture, you cannot touch the lecture. So it's a service. When you go to a restaurant and you and the service or the person serving you does it in a really nice way, you enjoy your time there, but you can touch that service. Now, when we talk of economic bads, these are things which are not wanted. Now, let's move on. We've just talked of resources as inputs. Uh, in the production of goods and services. Now, what are the main resources in economics? We generally have four main resources. Some textbooks will even talk of five or four or five factors of production. Now, the first one is land. How do you know what is land? Land is any free gift of nature. So your question, when you want to know if this is land, is to ask yourself, is it a free gift of nature? So when you look at a national park, just ask yourself, is that land? The other question is, is it a free gift of nature? When you see a lion or a giraffe, is that land? Ask yourself, is it a free gift of nature? And if the answer is yes, then it falls under the category of land. Now, when you talk of labor, this is mental and physical effort by human. Okay, so labor has to do with mental and physical effort by human. Capital, you have various types of capital. However, the main idea is that this is a produced means of production. We produce it to be used for producing other goods and services. For example, ask yourself, is fertilizer land? The question you should be asking is, is fertilizer produced by man for the production of goods and services? If your response is yes, then it is land then it is capital. Now let's move on to the next one where we distinguish the different types of capital. We have material capital, which are machines, equipments, plants. So machines, at times you see all the machines used for digging roads, 
for producing goods and services, those ones, you call them capital. Now, you also have what we call human capital, for example, education, skills, experience, and health. Now, finally, we have what is known as financial capital. There you are talking of money. So we have three main types of capital, material, human, and financial. And it's important for you to be uh, comfortable distinguishing between them. Now, the last type of resource is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship has to do with the ability and talent to organize resources to produce goods and services. Now, an entrepreneur is generally characterized by someone who can identify an opportunity for profit. Then they have the ability to organize the other resources or the other factors of production. Now, we've just said resources are land, labor, capital, and, and entrepreneurship. The entrepreneur can organize them together to produce goods and services and in so doing they take risk so you cannot talk of an entrepreneur without the ability of risk taking now let's move on in our lecture now when you own resources what do you get from it in economics we characterize the income from resources according to the resource the owner, of the owner. So here we say income is derived from the ownership of resources. So factors of production generate incomes for their owners. For example, someone who owns, let's see, okay, someone who owns land, what do they get? They get rent. So if you own land, first of all, I've told you how to distinguish what is land. Land is any free gift of nature. Now, because you own land, if someone is using it, they have to pay, you receive income from it. How will you call that income? You call it rent. Now, when you provide your services as labor, you, it's called wages and salaries. Someone who has capital, we call it interest and dividends. And for an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur gets profit. Now, what are the symbols used? Don't ask me why they use such symbols. R is for rent, this is the income from land, wages and salaries, here you have interest and dividends, and here they use pi, but it is for profit. Now let's move on. Economics, we said at the beginning that economics is a social science that studies how we go about using our scarce resources to satisfy our unlimited wants. Now, we've said it's a social science. The name science means it uses the scientific method to investigate any given economic phenomenon. Now, when we talk of the scientific method, what do we mean? Now, there are different ways of knowing things. You can know things because your parents tell you about. You can know it because the journalist said it. You can know things because someone in the authority has or maybe your religion or I don't know, your culture tells you about it. But the scientific method is a way of acquiring knowledge based on facts. And it has certain elements, for example, observation and measurement. This has to do with gathering the facts. Hypothesis is, the, is generally the claim you are making, and then you verify your hypothesis by gathering the facts and then using statistical methods to check it. So economists attempt to understand complex economic phenomena by using economic model. Now, when we talk of an economic model, what do we mean? It's simply a simplification of economic reality. We can use an equation. We can use a graph. The reality is much more complex, but when we use a model, it simplifies it. Now, in creating a model, we do what is called an aspect abstraction. So an abstraction is not a replication of the reality, but it's just something that looks, we take, we extract a, sim, a certain aspect of the economy and represent it either using a mathematical equation, a graph, or we can just describe it. So components of a model, when you want to model something, you first of all want to define the terms of your model. So if you have an equation, people need to know what is that equation. What are the different symbols you are using? So what do you define? 
the meaning of the terms or a concept used in the model, the assumptions. When we talk of assumptions, we are talking of the conditions under which the model is going to work. Now, in economics, we have some essential assumptions. For example, we always assume consumers are out to maximize their satisfaction or to maximize utility. So if you have $100, you will you have different options how to use it. We expect you will make the choice that gives you the highest satisfaction and satisfaction is subjective. What gives you the highest satisfaction may not be what gives me the highest satisfaction. Same thing with your time, maybe sleeping, maybe watching this uh, lecture, maybe going for a walk is what gives you the highest satisfaction. At the moment, it is subjective. Producers, we assume they are there to maximize profit. So they are not there to do philanthropic things. They are there to maximize profit. Whatever profit means to them, maybe philanthropy is, is part of the intangible profit they have, but they are there to maximize profit when they invest. Now, we also have the concept of Chetere's parables. This is an assumption that we generally make. And what does it mean? It means all other things being equal. Why are we making this assumption? We want to hold variables constant when we make a change. Let me take an example. So if you want to investigate whether people will buy more coffee if you increase the price. Generally, you assume if you increase the price, people will buy less. That is when you hold all other variables constant. Because if you increase the price of coffee when my income has just doubled, well, maybe I will even buy more coffee if I really like coffee. So you have to hold the other variables constant to be able to do your studies. Now let's move on to the concept of hypothesis. This is just a statement on a relationship between one or more variables. So it is an educated guess. It is something that makes sense. For example, you can hypothesize that if you increase the price of any good, holding all other uh, factors constant or Chetere's parables, the quantity demanded is going to fall. And you can test it. You can now collect data on that. So it, a hypothesis can be tested. We can establish economic theory from testing hypotheses and make generalizations. So economic theory is a general statement about the economy or one of its components, and we will see a number of economic theories in this course. Now, when we talk of a prediction or an economic prediction, it's a conditional statement on the direction of a variable. For example, if you predict how the GDP or the output uh, in an economy will look like. Are we going to produce more goods and services in the first quarter of 2023 or 2024? You, you can make a prediction based on your model. So it's just a conditional statement on the direction of a variable. Economic forecasting is assigning a future value to a variable. And of course, it has numerical value. For example, we can say by next spring, the rate of unemployment will fall to 7% or to 2%. That's just an economic uh, forecast. Now, let's move to what we call positive economics. Very important to, to understand this concept. Positive explains or describes how the economy functions. It deals with what is, what was, or what will be. So it's reliable. It's relying on facts. Generally, people don't argue about it because if you go about and you use the same method to measure the rate of unemployment or the rate of inflation, there is no argument about it. However, on the other hand, when you look at what is called normative economics, we are looking at what ought to be or what should be. For example, if we agree that the rate of, in of uh, inflation is maybe 10%, what should we do? Economists can disagree. It expresses one's subjective values. It cannot be tested because you are saying what should be done based on the positive facts. So generally, 
people like saying economists disagree a lot no they don't they agree generally on positive things but when it comes to policy then they can have disagreements so economists subscribe to different values or different schools of thought these values affect their perception of economic reality and policy so they may disagree on what should be done so economists Okay, economists may provide different explanations of the same economic reality. They may prescribe different policies to the same problem. So what do we mean by this? They may say this, for example, if you have inflation, they may disagree on what costs that inflation and what should be done to solve it. That's just the idea. Now, we have different types of uh, variables. An endogenous variable is, an, is a variable within a model so you can control that variable for example in your studies a variable you can control is the amount of time you spend studying now how the professor the how difficult the exam is you don't control that however you control the amount of time you spend studying so an endogenous variable for you will be the amount of time spent studying and an exogenous variable will be the level of difficulty of the test now when you talk of stock variable this is a variable that does not really depend on time it's not changing as time is changing you have a certain amount there that doesn't changes change maybe every day or every week but the flow variable is changing with time so if you put your money in the bank and there is interest on it, as time goes on, interest accumulates for that money. Now we have two main branches of economics. You have micro and macroeconomics. Microeconomics is there to study the behavior of individual households and firm. It looks at the individual units. It looks at things like the price theory. Meanwhile, macroeconomics is there to study the behavior of the economy as a whole. It looks at aggregates. And in this course, we will spend a fair amount of time looking at macroeconomic indicators like GDP, inflation, unemployment, and so on. Thank you and have fun with this. I'll see you in the next one.